Mallory is originally from Madison, so graduate of West High School, so I think I can even go whose house? <laughs> so it's so a proof, right? So um, Mallory uh, went to UW Madison as an undergraduate and got her uh, degree in zoology, now known as integrative biology. Uh, continued on her academic journey and got a master's degree at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, which sounds like a fascinating place, uh, and then uh, went over to the University of Arizona uh, to do her PhD. Uh, and it was during that time that I think we probably first met uh, when uh, Mallory was um, attending uh, and working with a uh, summer school that I teach at. And, her advisor organizes. and since then, I've noticed she has always been a, a superstar doing really cool research on vegetation, climate, interaction, <clears throat> does work with thermal drones and images that you might hear about, uh, also some deep work in modeling too in the past. And so, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, and so we'll see where this one's going because I know that you're always full of ideas. But uh, broadly, uh, we'll be hearing about beyond greenness, which as you, for those of you who know satellite work, that is a very popular thing to look at. Quantifying climate vegetation interactions from leaf to glow. And uh, we'll be with that. Uh, we'll that we may be uh, seeing if we can get a few folks who want to grab a beer after this to chat more. Uh, come find me. We'll walk over to you for yourself. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you today about research in vegetation and climate interactions. So I wanted to start off by introducing myself a little bit. I'm someone who thinks a lot about plants from above. So I think about plants from satellites, and I also think about plants from the air. And I think it's really a great way to look at how plants are interacting with the climate at these larger ecosystem and regional scales, and even global scales. So I just wanted to show some neat pictures. Here we've got some images of a forest near Bloomington, Indiana from a thermal drone that I um, have recently been using this summer. And so this drone looks at surface temperatures. And so I thought this is kind of neat because there's a strip of clear cut here in the middle of these two forest patches. So these, yellows col these yellow colors indicate that it's much warmer in that clear cut patch than it is in the surrounding forest. That's me holding the thermal drone from earlier this summer. I was about 75 feet in the air there. I don't think you can tell, but I was pretty scared uh, to let go with both hands for someone to take the picture. But um, that's been a really new and exciting uh, thing that we've been doing recently. And then I also wanted to include a picture of managed systems because I've also recently been, since moving to Indiana, looking at agricultural systems and how vegetation that's managed including farmland, can impact climate. Another thing I wanted to point out is that issues of scale are really interesting and important. And so this title of this talk is From Leaf to Globe. And so I just wanted to introduce why another reason why I think remote sensing is so exciting. So here we've got a uh, look at temporal scale here on the y-axis. And this is looking at plant processes that can be sub-daily all the way up to processes that change from months to years. And then we can also look across spatial scales. So we can look at things as small as a leaf or even smaller at microscopic stomata using some types of um, thermal imagery, all the way to the canopy and regional and global scales. And so there's different te uh, technologies in remote sensing that can be used that have strengths in different spatial and temporal areas. And I'd like to start talks off with this because I think this idea of scaling is really important when we're talking about vegetation climate interactions. So today, I'm going to be talking about how plants interact with the climate. And rather than having you digest all the uh, vast detail in these figures, what I'm trying to point out here is that plants influence lots of different aspects of the Earth system. So plants can impact surface energy fluxes, they can impact hydrology, and they're also involved in the carbon cycle from photosynthesis. So I like to think about plants not just from a carbon cycle perspective, but also from these hydrological and surface energy perspectives as well. So like I said, 
um, earlier, I'm talking about vegetation climate interactions here. We know that climate impacts vegetation, but vegetation also has impacts on climate. So this is a figure from an IPCC special report on vegetation climate interactions uh, from a couple years ago. And so this illustrates lots of different processes by which vegetation influences the climate. I'm not going to be talking about even close to all of these today, but I think it shows a nice view of all these different ways that vegetation can impact climate. And I'm going to be focusing in my talk both on this carbon dioxide piece here. So plants can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, which could potentially slow the rate of global warming. And also this idea of these exchanges of sensible and latent heat between the vegetation and the atmosphere. So like Ankur mentioned, another component of this talk is beyond greenness. And so I wanted to talk about that because a lot of the ways for a long time that we looked at vegetation at these large regional and global scales was using measures of satellite greenness. So these measures of greenness leverage the difference between near infrared and reflectance in the visible spectrum. And they can tell us things about how vegetation is doing in terms of um, is it reflecting a lot of near infrared? That probably means it's healthy. And so these healthy and stressed vegetation have really distinct spectral signatures. And so for a long time, this was the best and the only really way to look at uh, the terrestrial biosphere as a whole from space. So the thing about vegetation indices is that they're extremely useful and they're still really useful today. But what they don't do is correlate specifically with plant processes. They are related to plant processes at these large gradients, but when you try to nail down mechanisms, these are not, these, this greenness piece does not inform you about mechanisms or what's actually going on with the plant. So I, there's this new generation of recent and emerging advances in remote sensing that is making it a really exciting time to study vegetation climate interactions. And so here on the left are four different instruments that are either slated or currently aboard the International Space Station. These four instruments measure different components of different types of reflectance or different metrics. So this OCO3 estimates the column averaged carbon dioxide. EcoStress looks at land surface temperature. And um, what I wanted to point out here is that there's a whole range of different plant processes that we can get at with these next generation space-borne instruments that I'm really excited about and going to be talking about today are this carbon sink potential and also this evapotranspiration piece. These have been conceptualized, these next generation space-borne instruments, they've been conceptualized as flux towers in the sky. If you know a lot about Ankur's work, which I'm sure you do, um, these flux towers are really the gold standard in measuring the exchange of both carbon dioxide, water, and energy between land and atmosphere. But recently, with the advent of all these new instruments, Dave Schimmel, in a recent paper, conceptualized all these new um, advances as flux towers in the sky. So with these types of instruments, we can actually look at plant processes in a new way. I also wanted to point out that we're, at, uh, we're in the big data era, and things are changing extremely quickly. And so informatics approaches are really useful because they allow us to extract meaningful information from a deluge of data. So the amount of data on Earth systems is increasing exponentially all of the time. And so informatics approaches, including machine learning, which I'll be talking about in a bit, allow us to take that huge amount of data and try to extract actionable information from it. I also wanted to um, point out that federal agencies are getting really excited about these AI approaches. So I was just at a workshop yesterday put on by the Department of Energy for artificial intelligence, for Earth system predictability. And so a lot of these agencies, funding agencies, are getting really excited about these artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches. So I talked a little bit already about how plants can influence climate. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more specifically. So it can uh, plants can influence climate through surface energy fluxes, so that's changing albedo or the partitioning of sensible and latent heat fluxes. And then also on the right, with, through the carbon cycle. So they take out carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, 
which can take more um, offset carbon emissions and affect the rate of global change. I'm going to conceptualize those two different ways that plants can impact climate in this talk as biogeophysical versus biogeochemical. Um, I didn't think of this myself, but I think it's a useful conceptualization of the two different things I'm going to be talking about today. So first we've got our biogeophysical impacts, that's the surface energy impacts, and plants can change the latent and sensible heat fluxes. And then we've got the biogeochemicals piece, which in the context of this talk is mostly going to be the carbon dioxide. I think it's also worth noting that these two plant processes that I'm interested in today, transpiration and photosynthetic carbon assimilation, are both controlled by this microscopic stomata on plant leaves. So this is what actual stomata, and these plant stomata are these pores on leaves. When they're open, carbon dioxide can, can come in, but water leaves at the same time. And so when we're thinking about ideas of scale, I think it's worth remembering that these large-scale impacts of vegetation on climate are mediated through the apertures of these tiny, tiny microscopic pores. So specifically, when, today I'm going to talk to you about two different projects. First, I'm going to talk about this biogeochemical piece, and I'm going to talk to you about estimating dryland carbon uptake with eco-hydrologically informed machine learning. And then I'm going to talk about a biogeophysical type perspective, where I've quantified the impacts of reforestation on surface and air temperature in the eastern United States. So I'm going to first talk about this dryland piece. And so people who care about the global carbon cycle um, have recently come to understand the fundamental importance of drylands in the global carbon cycle. So dryland ecosystems are not super productive on an individual basis, but nevertheless, they dominate the interannual variability around the terrestrial carbon sink. So that's what this graph shows. And these semi-arid semi ecosystems are really what controls the year-to-year -year variability in the amount of carbon dioxide that the terrestrial biosphere takes up. So again, when we're thinking about, um, thinking about these dynamics, it's good to remember these plant stomata. And so we've got a leaf here, it's got an open stomata, carbon dioxide can in, and that can be used for photosynthesis, but at the same time, water escapes from the leaf. So if there's a water deficit, like as there often is in drylands, these stomata will close, and therefore photosynthesis is reduced. It's worth thinking about this not only because of drylands, but also because projections suggest that the future is drier almost everywhere. So understanding these water-carbon interactions is only going to continue to be more important in the future. In the southwest, where I've conducted this study, there's been a persistent drought for the last almost 20 years. So this is the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index, which is a drought index. And if we look at um, the drought conditions over the last 70 years, uh, we can see all this red. The southwest has been in a really severe drought for almost 20 years. Despite how important these dryland systems are in terms of the global carbon sink, dynamic global vegetation models, which is what we use to make most of our predictions about what's going to happen in the future, really struggle to predict this interagonal variability in carbon flux. So this is a paper from my colleague Natasha McGee's recent paper. And so this is just one model. This is the um, community land model. And so we've got model net ecosystem exchange here on the y-axis and observed on the x-axis. If this model were getting the interannual variability, we would expect it to be along this one-to-one -one line. But you can see that it's really just completely flat. So it's really saying these, these interannual variability doesn't vary at all from year to year, year to year. And that's not just true for CLM. That's true for almost all of these models that are tested. Some of them have kind of wonky behaviors here, but for the most part, they're really not getting this interannual variability that's so important for the global carbon cycle. This is another way to look at it in terms of gross primary productivity. And again, this just shows that the models are not getting the carbon fluxes um, accurately in terms of interannual variability. So, Dry, when we're trying to predict carbon fluxes in drylands, it's useful to remember some key eco-hydrological characteristics of drylands. So first of all, when we think about the water-carbon coupling, 
Drylands have really tight water carbon coupling compared to other ecosystems. That's because when they have stomata open to take up CO2, a huge amount of water escapes because it's really hot and it's really dry. So these plants have evolved to have super tight stomata control, and so the water and carbon cycles are especially tightly coupled in those systems. There's also really flashy responses to moisture inputs in these systems. So this is a time series of this carbon uptake versus primary productivity and soil moisture from a flux site in uh, southern Arizona. And so there's a rain event here in July 2015. And almost immediately after the rain event, there's this uptick in gross primary productivity. And so these ecosystems have really shallow root systems. They're extremely water limited. When there's any water, they can take that water and turn it into, um, which they, can have, they have this really big flush of activity, photosynthetic activity. You can look at it from phenocams. And so this is a picture before the rain event. And this is only about a week after the rain event. And the ecosystem is completely transformed. So these flashy dynamics are really common in these systems. Finally, drylands are really spatial, spatially heterogeneous. There's a lot of different land cover types. They vary from very small areas. So recognizing that we need a better way to predict dryland carbon fluxes, I developed an empirical uh, algorithm that I'm calling dryflux, which is a machine learning model that's specifically to predict carbon fluxes in drylands. This model is informed by our eco-hydrological eco understanding of drylands. So I included things like this, this drought index, SDEI, at multiple time scales. I included antecedent moisture conditions in terms of different lags of precipitation. And it also includes a really dense network of flux sites that spans semi-arid climate spaces. So just a little bit how we actually do this upscaling. We've got our flux tower here that's measuring in this case, carbon ex exchange between the land and the atmosphere. And so what I do is I take this flux tower and I take a bunch of different remotely sensed or other gridded inputs that I think should predict gross primary productivity. That includes things like those vegetation indices I discussed, precipitation, temperature. And so I stack all those up. I take all these different tower sites. I have all this different gridded remote sensing or climate data and I feed it into a machine learning algorithm. It, it, it can be different algorithms. In this case, it's random forest, but we've tried also artificial neural networks. And so that gives you a predictive model. So it develops these relationships between these gridded input data and the actual fluxes from the tower. Next, for spatial upscaling, I take those gridded inputs, I apply the predictive model that we generated in step one, and that gives you wall-to-wall -wall estimates of carbon fluxes. This is a picture of what the carbon fluxes actually look like. So this is the Southwest United States. These are the monthly gross primary productivity estimates. And so um, just to show you how it actually looks once you do the upscaling. So in terms of how dry flux is performing, I've compared it against the MODIS GPP algorithm, which is really commonly used to estimate gross primary productivity. It's a satellite-based estimate of GPP, and I also look at FluxCom, which is a machine learning upscale product that was designed for global applications, not specifically for drylands. So with these other models, you can see that they're, they're really not getting to that one-to-one -one line like we would want, but this model DryFlux is getting pretty close to the one-to-one -one line, indicating it's representing these carbon fluxes pretty well. We're also doing well on this interannual variability piece. So this is the relationship between modeled and observed gross primary productivity. And so um, the, the upscaled model FluxCom is not really getting most of these dryland sites like we would expect based on what I discussed, based on what I discussed earlier. But dry flux is getting those um, interannual variability and gross primary productivity with high accuracy. We're also getting the intra-annual intra dynamics, so these seasonal dynamics of carbon fluxes. This is a pretty typical a grassland site here, and so there's monsoon, uh, monsoon dynamics in the southwest. So we would typically see not a lot going on until there's kind of this peak in August. And so again, dry flux is getting that peak nicely. In southwest forest ecosystems, there's this pretty characteristic low peak of gross primary productivity. There's a springtime flush that's driven by uh, melting snow, 
then it dries off down in the early summer, and then the monsoon comes. And so we're getting this nice dual peak of first primary productivity pretty, pretty well in our model as well. This has big in, impacts because, like I said, this, this, these carbon fluxes vary a lot from year to year. And so when we actually have a model that accounts for this eco-hydrology, it's a lot more sensitive to differences from year to year. So I have a really wet year, a really dry year here. This is, this is the difference. And so there's a lot more um, difference in gross primary productivity with dry flux. Whereas if you have a model that uh, doesn't really have that sensitivity, it's really pretty much the same from year to year. Globally, I decided to look, I applied this model globally, did some validation in Australia um, and other continents that had dry land flux sites I could use. And I wanted to see how this model was doing when we looked at a really strong La Nina year in 2011. 2011 was a historic year. There was a huge amount of carbon uptake globally, and lots of different studies decomposed that and uh, concluded that it was because of dry lands taking up a lot more carbon that year than they normally would. And so when we look at the model's estimates of what the gross primary productivity should be that year, we're seeing really high carbon uptake in Australia, for example, that corresponds with what was actually seen using remote sensing data. So when we zoom in on Australia, we see something similar. It seems like dry flux is more realistically estimating these impacts of the El Nino, La Nina cycles on dry land carbon uptake. So overall, from this study, I wanted you to get that machine learning upscaling can predict carbon fluxes in these highly heterogeneous and dynamic systems, and that incorporating eco-hydrological water carbon coupling variables into the model development resulted in improved performance in dry lands. We're hoping that this uh, empirical upscaled product will be a benchmark that could help improve models in semi-arid ecosystems moving forward in the future. All right, now I'm going to move on to talking about the biogeophysical side of things. So with this project, we've been quantifying the impacts of reforestation on surface and air temperature in the eastern United States. So you might, if you've been on Twitter a lot, <laughs> you might have seen these types of figures over the last few years. These figures show um, how air temperature these are uh, each vertical line is an anomaly of global air temperature. And so this is really to illustrate how much things have been heating up in the last 20, 25 years or so. And so if we look at a, you know, a graph of global temperature, this is with some change point detection applied, things have been heating up really rapidly. But when we look at the southeast United States, this is for the state of Alabama, things are not really the same. We don't see that same sudden uh, sudden increase in temperatures, and it's not as clear. When we look at the temperature record and apply some breakpoint analysis to it, we can see an even more stark contrast. So things look like they were heating up until about 1960, and then things started cooling off, and things leveled up off a little bit. This has been colloquially, colloquially called the Southeast Warming Pole. And so before I talk more about the warming coal, I wanted to talk about the history of disturbance and reforestation in the southeast United States, which is really remarkable. So before 1800, forests dominated these ecosystems. This is a map of primary forest, and so the southeast was covered in primary forest. There was a widespread period of land clearing, farming, and clear cutting in the 1800s, and so by 1920, there was not much primary forest left. But in the early 1900s, a couple of things happened that led to a really rapid period of reforestation. One thing that happened was widespread agricultural abandonment, which allowed successional processes to take over, and so those ecosystems slowly started reforesting. But there was also an active reforestation campaign, campaign following World War II. So after World War II, the Civilian Conservation Corps was formed, and three million men planted three billion trees. This was a huge effort and it had a big impact on the reforestation in the Southeast United States. So in terms of the change in forest cover, it's estimated that there were 16 million hectares of forest added since 1910 in the Southeast. This here is a map of reforestation in the Southeast United States. So green areas reforested, white areas had no change, and then black areas did 
So most of the area has pretty significant reforestation. This is a picture of a tree plant planting crew in North Carolina in 1932. And so they're planting trees on these essentially barren systems. One thing to note too is that both new and young, uh, new and old forests are regrowing. So if we think about ecological succession, we've got forests that were planted in the early 1900s that are kind of in this category here. But we've also got pine plantations down there where the trees are re-harvested. Uh, so there's lots of trees that are young, forests that are young as well. So the southeast has cooled slightly in the last 100 years at the same time. So this is from the National Climate Assessment. This is my own analysis. And so this has been called the southeast warming. What we wanted to know is, is the Southeast Warming Pole related to the region's history of disturbance and reforestation? Excuse me. So I looked at this from two perspectives. I looked at this from the local perspective using flux towers, and then also the regional perspective using satellite data. I wanted to know how does reforestation affect surface and air temperature growth? Reforestation has a predictable, well, has characteristic impacts on the surface energy balance. So the first thing reforestation does is it reduces albedo. Forests are darker in color than grasslands usually. And so that, in isolation, would lead to warming. At the same time, forests have higher rates of sensible and latent heat fluxes that, in isolation, would lead to cooling. And so there's these competing mechanisms. Some lead to cooling, some lead to warming when we're talking about reforestation. I'm not going to get into this too much, but boundary layer dynamics are also really important when we're talking about reforestation. So we know that in boreal forests, albedo dominates. So reforestation, the boreal zone, actually leads to warming. In the tropics and the temperate zone, this latent energy effects dominate, and so forests should be cooler, are generally cooler. Uh, reforestation leads to cooling. But we don't know how these local cooling impacts translate to larger scales in temperate regions. We also don't know how these surface temperature effects translate to air temperature effects. All right, so the first thing we did was to compare grassland surface fluxes with co-located forests. This is using a paired flux tower approach, which is a great way to look at treatment effects on fluxes. So we had fluxes in grasslands, near fluxes in forests, and what we found was that in general, forests are cooler than grasslands. So here on the y-axis is the temperature change between forests and grasslands, and so below this um, zero line, forests are cooler, and above it, the grasslands are cooler. This is really dependent on the time of day to a large extent. <coughs> And it's also for different reasons. So during the growing season, it's cooler due to the increased latent heat flux. And during the dormant season, it's cooler due to increased sensible heat flux. We can look at this from space as well. And so I took MODIS land surface temperature. I normalized it by day minute air temperature, using that as a reference. And so we have the maximum surface temperature around 2 p.m. Uh, minus this air temperature around 2 p.m. And so that isolates this land surface temperature effect. What we're looking at here are maps of this difference between surface and air temperature as we move forward. So blue indicates cooling. And so the forests on this top row, we're seeing a lot of blue. There's a lot of cool surface cooling in these forests. But in these crops and grasslands, it's not quite the same. So there's a lot more red. And one thing to note as well is that there's cooling in July and August in the growing season, but it starts later than in the forests. So the forests we start to see cooling in May and June even. So there's increased surface cooling in forests that begins earlier in the season. And in crops and grasses, there's less surface cooling that begins later in the season. We can also look at this by looking at all of the um, surface for minus air temperature in the whole region doing some statistics on it, and uh, grouping it by land cover type. And so again, if we're looking at uh, below the zero line, that indicates cooling. And so what we're seeing 
that forests are one and a half to two degrees Celsius cooler than grasslands and croplands in the summer during the day. But I think it's important to think about air temperature. So that's arguably the more climate relevant variable. Reforestation has a near surface cooling effect, especially during the growing season. The air temperature is what we feel, it's what we care about when we're talking about climate change. We don't know if those surface effects extend to the air. So the first thing we did was an analysis of air temperature at 150 historical weather station sites. We did some change point analyses that I presented earlier. And we found this break point around 1960. If we look at the air temperature trend by land cover change over the 19th century, we can see this blue line is sites that reforested in the 19th century, and this red line is sites that didn't have any change in land cover during the 20th century. So before this break point here, these reforesting sites were warmer. That probably these sites were agriculture before they reforested. So they're warmer when they're ag sites. And then afterwards, this switches. So these forest sites become cooler. This is some indirect evidence that air temperature is related to this land cover change. We also went back to those uh, flux towers and looked at these air temperature, the air temperature measured from towers. So I showed you earlier how the, uh, they have, there's this really strong cooling effect in the middle of the day. We don't know if that extends to air temperature. When we look at air temperature here, it looks like this cooling effect mostly goes away. But that is not quite true because looking at air temperature from flux towers in forest versus grasses, it's not really an apples to apples comparison because of the different heights of the boundary layer and where the measurements are taken. So when we can do some corrections, and this is a work by Tim Novick to look at something called aerodynamic temperature or extrapolated temperature. I, um, I'm not gonna get into the details too much right now. So when we look at surface temperature, there's this really strong cooling effect. And when we do those corrections, there is still a cooling effect of forests, but these amounts on these axes are much smaller. So there's still a modest cooling effect on air temperature, but it's not as strong as the surface temperature. We can also look at remote sensing data to look at um, evidence for air temperature effects. So here is uh, I made a bunch of transects that cross forest grassland boundaries and look at air temperature every 10 meters across those transects. And when we plot all of those uh, all of those transects, looking across it zeros where the, the actual boundary is, and this is 200 years into the forest, 200 here is into the cropland. You can see it's cooler in the forest, and then as you get close to that boundary and cross it, it gets warmer and warmer. So this indicates that there's mixing between the air and the surface, and that there is some air temperature involvement in this cooling effect. So I've shown you pretty good evidence that there is a surface temperature cooling effect of reforestation, some evidence that this it extends to the air, but what about that warming hole that I talked about earlier? So I took all these long-term temperature trends, I went back and did statistical analyses to look at how the land cover change affected the slope of the temperature change over time. I found that with reforestation, those sites had a cooling of about one degree Celsius over the last hundred years. Forest sites also had cooling, though it was uh, significantly less. Agriculture had even less cooling over the last hundred years, but still cooling. And these deforested sites warmed up over the last hundred years. So to wrap up uh, this portion, of the talk, I wanted to deliver the key messages, which is that near surface cooling in the southeast United States is related in part to these reforestation and land use legacies. And that reforestation cools the surface by several degrees in the daytime, particularly in the summer. We also did historical flux and remote sensing analyses that support an influence of reforestation on the warming home. So now I'm going to talk a little bit with my remaining time about potential future directions, thinking about vegetation climate and, uh, interactions. So you may have heard about a lot of excitement about natural climate solutions 
natural climate solutions are ways that are proposed to get the climate to, uh, vegetation to work for us to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And there's some really optimistic estimates here about how much these natural climate solutions could potentially mitigate the worst effects of climate change. So this is kind of typical messaging for some of these natural climate solutions, talking about how much forest, uh, carbon dioxide forests take out of the atmosphere, and about how that's equal to emissions from power plants. I think that it's important to remember, first of all, that these natural or nature-based climate solutions are part of most of these pathways for limiting warming to two degrees Celsius, but that they are not sufficient in and of themselves. So whenever we talk about natural climate solutions, it's also important to say these are in addition to drastic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that are required for us to hit our climate warming targets. And so this is from a recent paper looking at potential natural climate solutions for the United States specifically. Reforestation here is way up here as one of the uh, climate solutions with the most mitigation potential. There's also cover crops here, which I'm going to to mention in a moment. But whenever we talk about natural climate solutions, they're ranked by this climate mitigation potential. How much carbon dioxide can they take out of the atmosphere? And these climate mitigation potential estimates are really quite uncertain. We don't have a lot of good data informing what we know about these uh, climate mitigation estimates. And so I think it's important to remember that most of these natural climate solutions also alter the water and energy cycles in potentially beneficial ways. So that would be climate adaptation as opposed to mitigation. So when I talked about the reforestation project, these forests in the eastern United States that are substantially cooler than grasses and croplands with respect to both surface temperature and near surface air temperature, that could be an example of climate adaptation. And so that's not really considered when we're talking about these different climate solutions. that we've been doing looking at another potential nature-based climate solution, which is cover cropping. So cover crops are crops that are planted during non-growing non periods. And so they improve water quality. And there's some interest that they could improve soil carbon sequestration. I've been doing work to estimate cover crops from remote sensing data. And I just wanted to mention this as an exciting potential uh, nature-based climate solution that we're trying to look at more. Like I mentioned, a lot of these nature-based climate solutions don't have a lot of data to support how much carbon they could affect and what is the uncertainty around that. So there's a, a working group in the Ameriflux, an Ameriflux working group, to look at nature-based climate solutions and how these networks of flux towers could help inform policy and um, political, uh, like private sector targets related to these natural climate solutions. So this is a figure from a paper that's about to be submitted by Kim Novick, looking at all these different ways that we could inform nature-based climate solutions with the best available science. So to wrap up, I talked to you about biogeochemical vegetation climate interactions, looking at eco-hydrologically eco informed machine learning and how to predict carbon uptake in drylands. And then I talked to you from a biogeophysical perspective about how forests in the eastern U.S. are substantially cooler than grasses and crops nearby with respect to surface and near surface air. So the take home points for my talk would be that explicitly considering water carbon coupling improved dryland carbon flux predictions in our machine learning upscaling algorithm, and that forests in the eastern United States are substantially cooler than grasses and croplands. And that, that's both surface temperature and to some extent air temperature. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my talk and thank my many collaborators on these projects. And thanks for listening. Cool. Well, we have some time for questions for sure. And it's a nice look to see your smiling faces behind the basket, please. Uh, questions? Uh, how much do things like the, uh, the vegetation index or uh, the amount of 
carbon flux of the uh, response to moisture or uh, the temperature difference between croplands and forests depend on the, spe uh, the species involved? Depend on the species involved? Yeah. It depends a good amount on the species involved. I mean, I think the reforestation piece, the species are less important because that's more about the physical features of a closed canopy. So that's like the roughness of the canopy and also how much water is taken up out of those trees. So I wouldn't expect species influences to have a huge effect, but I would still think it's definitely worth looking into. As far as the dry lens, those species are pretty important. And it's hard to get individual species, particularly at such a coarse spatial resolution. But those species, a lot of them have really different strategies in terms of how deep or shallow the soil moisture is, which would affect that water carbon coupling piece. So I think the species interactions are particularly important for the dry lens project. Good question. Yes? I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Um, Thanks. On the uh, machine learning part, uh, did the analysis give you any insights into some of the key controls? So thinking about the classic issue of black, you know, black boxes and machine learning. Mm -hmm. So in terms of informal mechanism of understanding the process you can to. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually have a backup slide prepared for that question, which <laughs> never happens, because I always make them until we ask the question I think they're going to. So um, this is the kind of thing that you can get from a random forest model. You can't get this from an artificial neural network, which is part of the reason I used that more simple uh, machine learning model. So you can get these variable importance scores. And so these are all these different variables in dry flux. And then this, how you know, big this bar is, is basically an estimate of the relative contribution to the variance that that particular variable is having. These are kind of unstable. Um, so if you run the model and break up the training and testing differently, these can shift to some extent. So for this one, we did a procedure where we did it thousands of times. And so these are the aggregate variable importance scores of thousands of runs into the different breakdown of this model. So in this model in particular, this last month's precipitation piece was hugely important. That gets into that flashy, you know, flashy dynamics I was talking about. What are the moisture conditions leading up to where we're actually trying to estimate the GPP? And then we also have these vegetation indices. I looked at both EDI and NDVI that come out as second most important. But this last month's precipitation is really, really the big, big driver. And the other models don't typically don't include so That was super cool. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming and giving us a great talk. Oh, so I'm great. kind of curious about the southeast warming hole and what the consensus in the literature is about its causes. So you're advocating that there's a big piece of it through forestation, but I'm wondering has anyone looked into you right, taking a, a heat budget approach? How much to do to anything surface heat budget related locally versus the effect of atmospheric circulation? Or natural, or that might be from natural variability or an externally forced signal. Most of the work that I'm aware of that kind of comes to potential conclusions about this is related to aerosols. So there's a lot of pollution. The radiation isn't getting down. Something's actually cool off. You kind of clean up the atmosphere with the clean water or clean air act rather. And so those aerosols went away. And so that has been proposed as a pretty. That's like the most common explanation for the warming hole that I've seen prior to this conversation about reforestation having the impact. People have also looked at these large scale climate circulations, and so there's some potential support for um, I think it's the Mary O'Donnell's circulation index having an influence on the warming hole. And I think it makes sense for a small portion of time, but it's not really consistent with the length of time that the warming hole has persisted. As far as a really detailed heat budget, I haven't seen anything like that in the literature, uh, but that is definitely something that someone should do, not before. That would be a good question. What would be your explanation for why the last month of precipitation has such a huge impact? What do you think that's doing? I think, it, I think it's accounting for soil moisture, because soil moisture is a very slowly varying variable, and so soil moisture should actually be slow to change. So I think the last month's precipitation tells us about this month's soil moisture. And soil moisture is really what these ecosystems care about. We have a follow-up project plan that's funded by a NASA satellite called SNAP, 
which is the soil moisture active passive satellite. And so we're actually looking at that exact question, taking remotely sent soil moisture and seeing is that what the model is doing? Is that why uh, this last month's precipitation is so important? So that's a great question. And then evaporative water loss. If you have forest versus agricultural crops, you, um, are you with the forest, you're going to be losing a lot more water, and if you're going to be having a lot more dry ecosystems around, how, how's that going to affect the overall water balance? Um, that's a good question. I haven't seen any major concern that forests are going to, well, actually, no, that's not true. I think it's a good question and something to consider in terms of if we plant huge swaths of forests, is that going to suck up all this water, and is that going to be a problem? there's going to be more dryness. There's some evidence that reforestation and the increased water circulation could just result in more moisture circulation in general. Um, but it's definitely something that I haven't seen a lot of work on. So I think that's a good, good question for sure. I wanted to follow up actually on uh, Lisa's question about other causes. The point about aerosols you brought up struck me to think about one of the things I know about southeastern forests is that a lot of the vegetation there are prodigious uh, emitters of organic compounds mm -hmm. and VOCs. Mm -hmm. And I know that those are linked to aerosol production. So I'm curious if there has been anything about links between reforestation, enhanced aerosols, potentially leading to cloud development as kind of another pathway for the cooling. I don't know how you would detect that necessarily, but it just kind of got me thinking a little bit about that. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that before. I think that's a really good question, and I haven't seen anything in the literature about it, but um, that is true that they are they do emit a lot of VOCs, so it could be related to the cloud formation. So that, yeah, that's a great question. Make sure all remember that. Yeah, it'd be interesting to think about like upper air data as well, like uh, radio sound, uh, radio sound and satellite uh, profiles that kind of separate out the surface from the yeah. Cool. Yeah. One more follow-up question, and just to really get through these results here. So you show that this this figure shows that the last month of precipitation is really important. Mm -hmm. and in the beginning, you motivated by saying that the interannual variability of the model didn't match observations at all. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at say monthly scale data model comparisons? Like, do the models get that kind of that month flush, that flashiness that you're describing in the systems? Yeah, I don't have those handy, but we have looked at the interannual variability in the model, and it's just completely wrong. So like the models. I mean, the actual data kind of goes like this, and the models just kind of have like a, it's just, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't go along with it at all. And so, um, interestingly as well, those models aren't really good at most of them. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, one more for Ben. Yes, we're going to stop and go very much. Yeah, I'm just curious, why, what's the reason you use both UVI and UVI here? Yeah, but that's a good question. So one thing about random forest is that it can handle correlated input variables, and so you don't have to do like specific, uh, it, it, that doesn't really matter in terms of the model performance and also the model parsimony. EVI and NDVI are slightly different in drylands in particular, and so they treat background soil reflectance a little bit differently. And so EVI is traditionally thought to do a better job of accounting for the background soil influence. That's particularly important in heterogeneous, like sparsely vegetated regions like drylands. So we included EVI, but we also included NDVI, which is slightly different. It should be getting at um, less of that. It, it's not going to be as sensitive to that soil impact, but in previous work, I found that NDVI was a little bit better at getting some of the intra-annual dynamics. So that's why we included both. All right. Well, with that, let's give you another hand. Thanks so much.